Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Let me start with some macro thoughts, a look at the world's highest yielding sovereign bonds. It's all Lebanon and Argentina. That's from Paul Wallace. It's really quite extraordinary and obviously these are defaulted. The Remimbi moving on the back of those headlines yesterday. There were a number of headlines. Uh, the main one that caught everybody's attention was that phase one was unlikely this side of Christmas. And uh, of course, the first responder is the Remimbi, which is at 7.04.30 now. And um, that, as I said in August, is the most important currency to watch. Uh, right now. Home thoughts, if you're looking for a Kenyan horror film script, here is an idea from Real Events. This is from Rashid Abdi. Baby snatching eagles with deadly talons strike in Mandara. They prey on babies below three, have appetite also for bald heads. Women mobilized to fight back, bald heads use metallic hats and wigs. And that really is quite peculiar and strange, isn't it? It could be out of Alfred Hitchcock. Oh my God, you've got to watch this. This is uh, uh, some footage of a hippopotamus which is moving at such speed. It's via Hadrian's Gate. It's taken in Zambia. The common hippopotamus, Hippopotamus amphibious or hippo, is a largely mostly herbivorous semi-aquatic mammal and ungulate native to sub-Saharan Africa. It is one of only two extant species in the family Hippopotamidae. And then uh, the atheist Arg is tweeting, be afraid, be very afraid. Now we'll have two months without sunshine here in Tromso, but the polar night light is the most beautiful, indeed it is. That's from Benedict E. Uteng. And then I came across this tweet from Caitlin Green. Cowrie shells found in a grave on Gotland imported from the Red Sea or Indian Ocean area. Object from the exhibition, we call them Vikings, produced by the Swedish History Museum. Imported cowrie shells were sometimes worn as pendants from the Red Sea or Indian Ocean area. Grave find, Jastav Sander, Gotland, Sweden, 1763. And that took me to William Wordsworth, the sea, the seashell from the excursion. I've seen a curious child who dwelt upon a tract of inland ground applying to his ear the convolutions of a smooth-lipped shell to which in silence hushed his very soul, listened intensely, and his countenance soon brightened with joy, for from within were heard murmurings whereby the monitor expressed mysterious union with its native sea. Even such a shell, the universe itself, is to the ear of faith, and there are times I doubt not when to you it doth impart authentic tidings of invisible things, of ebb and flow and ever-during power, and central peace subsisting at the heart of endless agitation. That reminded me of my childhood. I used to collect cowrie shells. We learn nothing from history except that we learn nothing from history. Marcus Tullius Cicero. And for some reason that took me to here we go round the prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear, the prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear, five o'clock in the morning. President Trump is seen holding notes while speaking to the media before departing the White House for Texas. 
Um, it's been an extraordinary uh, few days of testimony. Uh, um, uh, Neil Katyal, I've read the Sondland testimony, and boy, it is devastating to Trump. Remember, this is the one guy Trump pointed to to exonerate him. Excerpts and quick analysis below. Click on the link. I responded to Neil and said, the pivot in the call with Sondland, Ray, no quid pro quo, which was obviously triggered by the announcement of the inquiry, um, uh, is a potential escape hatch because few folks will interrogate the timeline effectively, I think. Forward, reverse, forward, and again backing up the bus over Secretary Pompeo's face. This is from uh, George Conway. Holy cow, Gordon Sondland going full John Dean in opening statement confirms his view. The White House plot was quid pro quo, implicates Giuliani, shows Pompeo in the loop with new evidence, implicates Trump, tra testifies this was on his orders, Ari Melba, adds new emails and evidence. Sondland, Mr. Giuliani's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States and we knew that these investigations were important to the President. Pompeo knew, Bolton knew, Mulvaney knew, everyone was in the loop, Sondland testified. And uh, essentially my takeaway is that the escape hatch is that call that's being referred to and I think therefore this is going to be a political uh, outcome in the sense that it will be difficult to move Republicans to the side of the Democrats. However, I think it is a prima facie case of quid pro quo. Um, 4th of November, I touched on the fact that the President was undergoing an impeachment process at the hands of nervous speaker Nancy Pelosi. His moniker, which probably is a linguistic transference of his sort. And in that article I was touching on the UFC episode at Madison Square Garden and I was uh, drawing a comparison with the Police Verso or Verso Police, which is a Latin phrase meaning with a turned thumb that is used in the context of gladiatorial combat. It refers to the hand gesture or thumb signal used by ancient Roman crowds to pass judgment on a defeated gladiator. And I was saying then that the Republican Party will be making a hard-nosed political calculation. If the president is getting booed at a UFC event, the base is lost. However, the base seems to be reasonably solid in these impeachment inquiries. But I was predicting that Vice President Pence is the coming man and it could happen really quick. President Trump, as I said, is seen holding those notes and you can see what his notes were and he's referring to that phone call to which I'm referring, for which the catalyst for him to use that phrase was obviously the announcement of the impeachment inquiry. War is coming was an article I wrote on the 15th of October. This was the China-US uh, uh, standoff. And I've come across, uh, then I saw this announced, this from Vice President Wang Qi Shan at the New Economy Forum. Between war and peace, there's no doubt we should choose peace. And I've also come across this gentleman, man underscore integrated on Twitter, who's done some fabulous analysis. I must commend him. In late January 2019, China released footage showing off its devastating new intermediate-range ballistic missile, the Dongfeng, the East Wind DF-26, which has been dubbed the Guam Killer. In my article I was saying, apart from a few half-hearted and timid phonops, China has established control over the South China Sea, it has created artificial islands 
and then militarize those artificial islands across the South China Sea. China never signed the INF nor any other non-proliferation or non-development agreement. The Chinese could do as they pleased. The US was fighting with one hand tied behind its back. Asymmetry of force is a key goal in any conflict. I was saying the incident with the USS Decatur, where a Chinese warship came within 45 yards of the Decatur in the South China Sea, is surely a precursor. Man integrated, as of today, China has 11 models of ballistic missile with overlapping ranges, launch platforms, sea, land, air, and payloads. BRI is the artery, missiles are the blood. And I think that's important. Um, they further have three models of conventional cruise missiles with the HN3 reaching out to 3,000 kilometers. So, as I said in October, this geopolitical contest will escalate dangerously. Powerful forces on both sides are driving the two world's strongest countries towards fully-fledged confrontation. And the important point he's making is that the US does not have a publicly known capability to get inside China's ballistic missile threat envelope outside of submarines and our own intercontinental ballistic missiles. He's saying the trade war fundamentally is the only form of asymmetric warfare available to the Trump administration. The US cannot bully the Chinese militarily, they have the Navy boxed out. The media, culture makers, companies who rely on Chinese labor infrastructure and many U.S. allies all have a vested interest in lying about the trade war. <clears throat> China doesn't play by the rules. Their missiles have declared the end of U.S. hegemony and the West paid for them. So, what he is essentially saying is that they can exercise uh, force projection in the littoral zones. They've expanded all the BRIs, so they've got uh, ports which have a dual purpose all across the world. It's a very interesting analysis. He's very much worth following. Uh, few Chinese believe that China and the U.S. can reach a deal soon. Given current poor China policy of the U.S., people tend to believe the significance of a trade deal, if reached, will be limited. That's huge. China wants a deal but is prepared for the worst case scenario, a prolonged trade war. Trump says China would have to make a deal he likes and threatens to raise tariffs further if no trade is reached with Beijing. And I wrote about this again on the 26th of August this year when I was saying China is striking back at Trump. Ivan the K put it pithily and tweeted China to the chosen one, GFY. The stock markets fell sharply. Overarching question investors need to ask themselves is this. Is this a permanent rupture or is this a crazy off-the-charts escalation just before a deal? The markets pirouette on the answer to this question. Um, and I was also saying in May 2019, the point being in the trade war, Trump is no longer the decider. In the US, there is clearly a consensus baseline for a full toe-on-toe -toe slugfest, as it were. And I said in China, there is only one decider, who was pronounced as much by Xinhua in a historical announcement in March 2018. Z reckons he can di direct a su successful society-wide struggle in the trade dispute, notwithstanding all the hyperbole and very partisan commentary. The following are the plain truths. The markets are still pricing in a benign, but much less benign than a month ago outcome. This was in May. We need to consider what a non-benign or even maximum non-benign outcome looks like. I also tweeted the art of the deal, it's Z who is the decider, because it is Z who can crash the US stock market 
and with it POTUS's re-election chances. And that's quite an extraordinary signal in all the noise. Uh, Nicoletos, looking at the data, one will see that China has been divesting its presence from abroad to cover for the lack of incoming capital. In 2016, China's net outward investments reached $278 billion for 2019. This number is likely to go negative. And I take you back to Xi Jinping talking about the end of vanity. Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Lenin, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. Victoria Northwest and North Region has been advised to evacuate almost half the state of Victoria, code red. I was writing about this in the End is Nigh on the 30th of September, and I was speaking about the feedback loop and the risks of dieback where we enter a phase of cascading system collapse. Whale sharks could be swallowing 137 pieces of plastic an hour because the surface waters where they feed are so contaminated. Complex systems have mechanisms, not leaders, NN Taleb. And in the 21st of October, in an article called The New Economy of Anger, I was saying leadership in the 21st century has become nationalistic and jingoistic horizons have been narrowed, and I was calling this phenomenon of revolution a revolution and a global phenomenon. Currency markets, Euro-Dollar, 110.76, dollar index, 97.88, Japanese Yen, 108.56, Swiss Franc, 0.9908, the Pound, 129.29, the Australian dollar, which is a proxy for the trade war, 0 0.6799. India rupee, 71.75. South Korean won, 1177.78. The real, 4.1967. Egyptian pound, 16.099. And the rand, 14.75. Dollar in index, bit below its year highs at 97.88. Euro dollar, this chart is from FX Pip Titan, last at um, 110.76, but well supported. As I wrote over the weekend, the pound has risen from multi year lows like a phoenix and has room to rally further, especially if Bojo Boris Johnson builds a big lead. Sterling danger for zone for shorts is 129.41 to 129.51 that's fx pip titan gold last trading at 1470.80 oil the trend channel since october still in place just last at 56.80 emerging markets the jp morgan em fx index Looks like it is going to break down to new all-time lows. That's from Raul. And this speaks to the feedback loop phenomenon I was talking about, where China exerted the power of pull over a vast swathe of the world over the last two decades. We can call it the China, Asia, EM, and Frontier Markets feedback loop. But essentially, that is now reversing. Yields pass 100%, just put Lebanon into Venezuela territory. The political crisis in Lebanon has sent the yields on some of its dollar bonds into triple digits. Rates on the government's $1.2 billion of notes maturing in March next year climbed 15 percentage points on Tuesday to 103%. They were at 13% just five weeks ago, just before the start of nationwide protests that led to the resignation of Prime Minister Hariri. Lebanon, viewed by many bond traders, is a default waiting to happen. Cash prices have become more important than yields as they factor in potential recovery rates. That's inverted the government's curve, distorted yields at the shorter end, 
The price of Lebanon's 2020 debt is 78 cents on the dollar, while that of its April 2021 securities is at 56 cents. It's rare for a nation's dollar bond yields to reach triple figures, even in Argentina, where investors are far from convinced that the incoming leader, Fernandez, can fix the country's economic woes. They haven't gone far beyond 85%. Venezuela's short-term bonds reached 100% around the time it defaulted in late 2017. According to central bank governor Riyad Salame, Lebanon has the money to repay $1.5 billion of securities maturing at the end of this month. I wrote about this in that article, The New Economy of Anger, and specify, specifically mentioned the WhatsApp revolution in Lebanon and said prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. I also was quoting Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form, not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a machine uh, of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. Here you see revolutionaries trying to blockade parliament. That's from Abu Jaja. And of course, I love that song from, uh, well, that, that uh, radio mix by Ronnie Saikali. Um, it's really quite tremendous. For the first time ever, Lebanon no longer allows a transfer of funds abroad, not only via banks, but also via Western Union or MoneyGram. The bankruptcy flag is no longer very far, E.J. Malray. And that phenomenon could spread like wildfire. Sub-Saharan Africa, this is happening right now at the MDC Zimbabwe headquarters where the MDC president, Nelson Chamisa, was meant to address the nation from. That's from Daddy Hope. This is the real Emerson Manangagwa government on display. It has closed all democratic space and uses violence to enforce its rule by brutality. Um, you can see some photographs from Zim Live. Chamisa was meant to deliver a speech, the hope of the nation address, but was unable to. Police fired tear gas, used truncheons to violently disperse MDC supporters outside the party's headquarters. 21st of January, I was saying what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. At the time of the Jasmine Revolution in Tunis, the crowds chanted, we're not afraid, we're not afraid, we're afraid only of God, and we must be close to that moment. 29th of July, the inflation rate was 176%, now it's over 500. I was also saying that the mind game that ZANU-PF had played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. Um, Manangagwa himself was in Dubai sharing our story and incredible potential with entrepreneurs and investors. I will continue to toil both at home and abroad to put Zimbabwe back on its feet. As I said on the 9th of September, Manangagwa, who was eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. Bank of Zambia raised key interest rate to curb inflation, raised the rate to 11.5% from 10.25%. Um, inflation accelerated to 10.7% in October, the highest level in three years. Electricity cuts also mean that many businesses run on generators, increasing their input costs because the Kwacha's 18% drop against the dollar this year has pushed up fuel prices. As I've said severally, but the last, on the last occasion in October, the canary in the African coal mine is Zambia. Investors have lost faith in government promises to get spending under control, and the government has fallen out with the IMF as well. Keep the tango dancing as we say, let's see where it will go. I don't see it going now, but just keep tango dancing with these guys, and let's see where it will go. This is about the pre-invest um, court case that's happening now. Pierce testified Dambi Gueveza, the son of Mozambique's former president, collected at least $50 million in legal payments for helping introduce Priv Invest executives to his father. 
Bustani said that during a personal audience with then President Guabeza and his son in early 2013, he told the president a Mozambican man had asked for a $50 million bribe, stunning the country's leader. The president was frozen, then he looked at his son, then he quoted the president's response, Mr. Bustani, you're talking about big strategic projects. My answer to your question is simple. Nobody, nobody, not me, not any public official in Mozambique will be allowed to take one penny in order to do their job in this project. You say no and you come to me and you tell them no. I said sorry, but I had to do it. This is a photograph I took of Maputo from the sea and this is another photograph I took of an evening shot in Maputo as well. South African all shares up 8.68% year to date, dollar rand at 17.87589, 14.7589, still in that 14.50, 15.50 range. Egyptian pound, fresh high 16.0993. EGX 30 plus 9.12% year to date. Nigeria in remittances, $30 billion of FDI, $1.9 billion of oil earnings, $35 billion by 2025 of remittances, sorry, remittances uh, uh, 2018, 30 billion, 1.9 billion oil earnings, remittances expected to be 35 billion by 2025. That's from Africa Solar. Nigeria all share down 14.81% year to date, Ghana Stock Exchange down 14.48% year to date. This is Bob the Baobab tree still standing strong after at least 1,200 years at Mombo Camp in the Okavango Delta. That's from Michael Polizza. Temperature changes in the Indian Ocean lead to extreme weather events in Australia and East Africa. Global heating is supercharging an increasingly dangerous climate mechanism in the Indian Ocean that has played a role in disasters this year, including bushfires in Australia and floods in East Africa. Kenya raises 66 billion shillings from state corporations for the budget out of a target of 78 billion in dividends and retained earnings from state corporations, the acting finance minister said on Wednesday. Yukua Yatani said state companies have not been remitting their dividends at the end of every financial year as required by law denying domestic reports of the move to take the cash would starve the banking sector of liquidity. These are just surplus funds. Their operational accounts and all other matters have not been touched, he told Reuters, adding that the extra cash would be spent on development projects. No bank wants to finance you anymore, especially if you have a contract from the government, said one small business owner who spoke on condition of anonymity. A second supplier said you get disrupted in the middle of the contract either because you're not speaking to the right people, making commitments to the right people, or your payments may just be delayed. They are financially stuck, managing director of Leakey's auctioneers, adding he was dealing with at least one such case every day. Central Bank Governor Patrick Jirogi said in late May that delayed payments to suppliers, the bulk contracted by the government, made up 10% of the total volume of bad loans. Such loans stood at 12.4% of the total in April, the highest level in more than a decade. Equity banks' group's growing earnings from remittances raises its credit worthiness, places the institution ahead of its regional competitors at Moody's. They're basically the biggest uh, inward-bound remittance receiver, and that's also a source of cheap cash. Uh, share price data, Price earnings ratio of 9.124, market cap of about $1.8 billion. And they're paying $105 million in cash um, and, a, uh, and, a further, and buying out KFW uh, to further consolidate their position in the DR Congo banking sector. Nairobi all shares up 10.59% year to date, and the NSE 20 is down 7.68% year to date. Thank you.